Welcome once more to the first session of this conference, which is a very unusual session, the panel on educational science and policy making. That was one of the issues we have been dealing with in the executive committee in recent years, and that was discussed lots of time, that we think and we are pretty sure and, and our success of our research has shown that, that we are absolute world class in research, in learning and instruction but that we always have to struggle with the question, what does the public know about our research? What does policy know about our research and how do we inform each other about that? And we felt that that is an issue early has to address more explicitly and we have to, to think about that. And when we were talking about the conference theme and how to appropriately introduce that to our society, the idea was made by Eero that we could have such a panel where we, intro, where we invite people from policy, people from policy making, from our own society in order to interact on that. And then in the beginning we were a bit hesitating and that said that would only work appropriately if we get really prominent people from these fields to our conference. And then we were hesitating, do we manage to get really very prominent people to our session? And Yaro said, yes, of course we can do. We are important enough and, and there are enough relations and we just have to work on them. And then we tried it out and we composed a panel which is so outstanding that I'm a bit ashamed that I'm the one who has to present it. But I'm glad that these six people are here. And I will briefly introduce them to you and then we open up the floor. Opening up the floor means that these panelists have been asked to think about five questions, we, four questions we sent out to them and to give some statements and some provocations and some ideas on that. The first, how is early based research perceived by policy? How relevant is what we do for policy? The second, what is in general the relevance of evidence based work on from a policy making perspective? How do we impact policy making and administration? The third, our results of our research on learning and instruction appropriately disseminated and communicated to the public. And fourth, are national and European instruments of funding research adequate or is there a need to be more in interaction with policy driven programs and relate them to our own research programs? That's what the panelists are going to talk about and you are after their presentations, not more than 10 minutes per person, Eero is keeping the time. We are opening the floor. We have questions among the panelists. We might have questions which are sent to us via Twitter, which we can respond to. And you are very welcome to ask your questions as well so that we get an into the interaction with our guests from here. Very brief introduction of the guests. The first you already know, it's the rector of University of Tampa, Lisa Laxo. She has been professor very appropriately for our panel, Professor for International Development in, a, in US Korea, if I'm right, Professor for World Politics in, in Helsinki University, so exactly in the field where we are talking about. Dirk van Damme is the head of the Innovation and Measuring Progress Division in the OECD Directorate for Education and Skills, much related to CRE programs, to the INES programs, but also Professor of Educational Sciences in Ghent University, formerly. Next is Ola Pekka Heinonen, he's Director General of the Finnish National Agency for Education. And he had quite a number of different positions as Minister in Finnish governments, as State Secretary in Finnish governments. For example, he has served as Minister for Education in Finland, which is then, of course, very close to representing both our ideas. Next sitting there is Manfred Prenzel, former member of our Executive Committee, organizer of the early conference 2013 in Munich, professor and founding dean of the School of Education at Technical University in Munich, and had been director of our Leibniz Institute for the Natural Sciences, and had been for a couple of years the chair of the German Council of Science and Humanities, advisory board to the government in Germany concerning our the research activities. Next. To Manfred is Sana Jawele, the president-elect of Early, who will become president of Early at the end of this week. She is a professor at the University of Oulu, and they are the head of learning and technology research group. And the sixth panelist is Kai Sauer, who is ambassador. He's the head of the Finnish embassy for the United Nations in New York, had been worked with 
former president of Tisari in the Kosovo and had then been serving as ambassador for Indonesia, East Timor. So we have really a very prominent group of, of panelists who have lots to contribute to our topic of policy making and educational science. Thank you very much for being here. And I'll invite Lisa for her statement as the first of the panelists. You can decide on your own whether you are sitting here or Thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, opportunity to reflect the importance of research for policy making in the field of education. Well, my first remark is that uh, Finnish students have succeeded in PISA results, which is maybe something you all know. And teachers' education certainly is one factor behind that success. And I think that we have ma maintained the high level of teachers' education at Finnish universities. This is evident, for instance, in the fact that teachers' education is one of the most popular programs at our universities. In Tampere, for instance, we have 10 times more applicants than we can accept to the Faculty of Education. Teachers are well educated and well respected in the society. But there are also other factors behind the Finnish PISA success, most importantly, the welfare state, including comprehensive health care services, for instance. Income inequality in Finland has remained markedly lower than the average of the EU member states. However, since the onset of the global financial crisis, inequality has grown. One very clear indicator is that differences in in health and life expectancy between socio-economic groups in Finland have grown. This development coincides with the decline in Finland's performance in PISA. So what I would like to point out is that uh, we need multidisciplinary research, research also in socio-economic factors when we want to tackle the challenges of our education policies. But I would like to mention also one, uh, one case area where research evidence has been recently utilized by, by the policymakers, and that concerns the field of early childhood education. Earlier this year, our Minister of Education appointed reviewers to look into what would it take to raise the participation rate in early childhood education and to maintain the required skills. One of those experts in that group was uh, Professor Kirsi Karila from our university. And according to the reviewers, the participation, participation rate in early childhood education and care should be raised and the structures, numbers, qualification, uh, qualification and skills of personnel should be further developed. As a result, uh, the government has decided lower fees in early, uh, early childhood education so that um, for children to preschool at age of uh, five. Uh, other recommendations in that uh, roadmap included also raising the number of students admitted to kindergarten teacher training in universities. And the emphasis was that uh, master level education is uh, useful also in that field. There is currently a shortage of kindergarten and special needs kindergarten teachers with university level education. Um, the roadmap would also like to see the Children Daycare Act updated. And uh, one of the interesting uh, issues that has been discussed concerns uh, the uh, willingness of families to utilize the possibilities, uh, to, to utilize the childcare uh, system. And this then relates also to the social benefits that are provided by the state for families, uh, which uh, uh, 
allow or which uh, encourage even sometimes families to take care of the children at home until the age of three years. This is again one issue that points out that also other factors and research on other fields have an influence on, on uh, education. Um, taking care of children at home has, has received, uh, or the question has been even politicized by the, by the government parties. Is it a question of freedom provided to families or is it a question which is uh, encouraging particularly uh, uh, families with, uh, where parents do not have uh, uh, higher education or parents uh, who have immigrant background, does it uh, encourage them to, uh, 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 does it encourage the mothers of these families to stay at home and then also prevents the children uh, children's participation in pedagogical early childhood education. Um, so uh, this, uh, this example, I think, uh, uh, brings uh, uh, to, the is to the issue the, to the, uh, or, or uh, shows the importance of, uh, of coherent policies of the government. There are different uh, fields that, uh, that needs to be looked at when, uh, when the policies are formulated. Um, last but not least, I would like to uh, reflect uh, the question raised by the chair on, uh, on the support and fund for research uh, in, in education. And uh, here uh, we have had uh, difficult times at the universities. In 2015, after the weakening of the country's economy, the Finnish uh, government announced that basic funding to our universities and polytechnics was reduced by approximately 500 million euros. Uh, in practice, this has led to a situation where universities have had to uh, have not been able to fill all teachers and researchers' positions. For instance, last year, the University of Helsinki had to cut staff numbers by nearly 1,000 persons. In this kind of situation, it is difficult for universities to expand education in any specific fields, like for instance in, in, uh, children, in uh, early childhood education, if at the same time we are lacking resources in areas which are performing otherwise very well in scientific research. I would like to emphasize the importance of multidisciplinarity even in these fields. It is important that we have good science base uh, in health, society, economics in the future in Tampere. Uh, we, we can also more strongly include digitalization and technical sciences to, th to these fields. If we are strong in, in, uh, in science and um, in, uh, in, uh, at many disciplines, then we have bases to provide uh, research-based uh, education. Um, in, in specific areas like early childhood uh, uh, education. But there are also positive examples in the, in the government policies with regard to research funding. And I would like to mention strategic research funding instrument that was renewed two, or two years ago, maybe three. three years ago. And that has uh, uh, the, 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 uh, in, in practice, the kind of uh, policy-relevant research that the ministries previously were uh, commissioning quite separately from it, each other, these, uh, these instruments uh, have been put together and, uh, and the topics are very clearly thematic and, and policy-oriented and multidisciplinary also. So this kind of strategic uh, research uh, uh, 
benefiting the, the policymakers is is an area where I think that also um, education research can uh, can go forward. So, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for these critical words from the perspective of a university leader. Dirk, the floor is yours. Yeah, good morning. I, I will stand because the, the monitor is very small and otherwise I cannot read my own slides. Um, very happy to be here uh, and to speak about this topic uh, because it's um, a topic which goes right to my heart. It's um, about reflecting on my own career. I have started my career as a researcher became university professor in educational sciences, then moved to the government. I taught for one year. I ended up 14 years being in the government in the Flemish part of Belgium as chief of staff of uh, seven education ministers. So I was on the other side of the barrier. And now in, I'm a bit in the middle in the OECD between governments and, and science and research. Um, I want to make my three statements very clear from the beginning, and I will then expand a little bit on it. Um, I think the situation is rather positive. It's moving in the right direction. Uh, when I listen to ministers, they are more willing to take into account research evidence. Um, so the, the, the global picture is actually quite positive. But it's probably not moving as fast as you would like or as I would like to, to be. Um, and that has to do with problems on the side of policymakers, and it's very popular among scientists and researchers to blame policymakers, um, and it's very easy to do that, but we should also look at the problems on our side. There are quantity problems, but there are also quality problems. And then finally, I would like to say, well, don't expect educational research evidence to feed into education policy making automatically. Education is a knowledge intensive sector, it's not a research intensive sector. And I want to make that distinction between knowledge and research. Research is only a very small part of um, knowledge and the research evidence cannot meet all the knowledge demands of the education sector. So let me first um, highlight the positive trends the supply of research, good quality research is increasing, the demand is there, um, and many ministries have established specific units or departments or institutions in, in the ministry uh, to deal with knowledge. Um, and there is also a role for knowledge brokerage institutions. This is a very interesting field, but I will not expand on that. Yet, there are so many examples um, and you all have them in your own experience, I'm, I'm sure, that evidence is not moving into uh, policy as easily as we would like. And there is a lot of frustration among the research community about um, what, what policymakers are doing, making the wrong decisions, even if research evidence is pointing into different directions, etc. I'm well aware and I'm well, um, I'm very familiar with all these uh, sometimes very um, emotional uh, debates. Um, one problem is quantity. Um, and it's also a little bit blaming ourselves. We are good in assessing and measuring everything except ourselves. Um, we don't have good reliable indicators of educational research, um, and we should have. If we compare, these data are a few years old and we, we try to develop a, a good measure of educational research intensity. Um, education and health are approximately of the same size in terms of GDP. Um, but education has only one-seventh of the research that the health sector uh, is mobilizing. So there is a huge quantity problem. Maybe in the meantime it has a little bit improved. This is approximately six, seven years old. Um, but the problem is we, we don't know. So if we want to make a claim for better research and more research, we should have indicators. We should have data on our own research, and we don't have them. A um, bit more delicate, we also have quality issues. And you probably know what policymakers are, are 
claiming or what, what they are complaining about. Um, and this kind of critical rhetoric is very popular among these days among policy makers. Um, educationalists or re educational resciences rarely willing to step out of, their, their, out of their comfort zone to take responsibility. How often do we say, well, I know this, but not beyond that, I don't know anything, I cannot generalize, I cannot uh, give you any meaning, I just give you the, uh, the facts, different ideas about usability, about useful knowledge. Um, there is a problem, I dare to say, being in the field for so many years, there are quality issues among a lot of our research. There is sometimes uh, too much emphasis on ideology, um, very partial answers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think researchers should pay a penalty every time they write more research is needed to answer this question. Um, this is making policymakers very, very angry. Don't do it. You are ruining your own case if you put that in a report or a summary or whatever. Um, this is probably a little bit too complicated to read. It's just to say, because education is at the right, sand, um, the right side of the graph, education is one of the most knowledge-intensive sectors, but it's one of the least research evidence-intensive sectors. So, this is based on a, a survey uh, where professionals working in a sector were asked about um, their innovation. Um, and it, it is simply not true that educational policy and practice are not driven by knowledge. But the research part of it is very small because there are many competing knowledge systems in education, maybe more in education than in any other sector. Um, professional knowledge, tacit knowledge, um, teachers' experiential knowledge, which is transmitted in teacher training colleges. Not everything which is taught in teacher training is evidence-based. Um, but I, I'm saying it cannot be completely evidence-based because we don't have enough evidence to fill the knowledge needs of knowledge professionals that teachers are. There is a lot of anecdotal knowledge. Um, the minister I worked for, the last one. He is an academic. He has a PhD from Oxford. He's one of the most respected intellectuals that I know. Yet, every serious discussion we started or ended with, my niece working in that school, she complained to me that, 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 that this is happening. It was not any research evidence that he was referring to when concluding a discussion. It was anecdotal knowledge, which is very, very powerful in education. We have traditions, we have norms. Education is one of the most value-ridden systems that we have. Everyone has a view on education. So there are many competing knowledge systems which are not to be dismissed by researchers. They are not bad because they are not research evidence. Um, but we have to realize that as researchers, we move in a knowledge arena which is very uh, competitive, which is different in health. Um, so let me uh, come to a couple of conclusions. Uh, I would be very humble as a researcher. Evidence-informed is much better than evidence-based. Um, we should not have a very narrow definition of research knowledge, because otherwise we are limiting our own impact. We should understand that education is very normative, value-intensive, and that policymakers have to face very difficult questions where the research evidence often is very poor or very limited. But policymakers, of course, should better understand the logic, the potential, and the limits of educational research. Let's focus on improving communication. The communication channels between the research community and policymaking are often very, very poor. We should organize that better. Um, and there is a lot to, to be said about this. Um, I'm a bit hesitant about this claim, but let's move away from defining international peer-reviewed, high-level quality research as being the gold standard in the research. 
We need to expand the limits of what we mean by research. I don't know whether you know this famous book about mode one and mode two research. Um, we need more mode two research, applied, not easily generalizable. Um, so more intermediate between research and policy making. And finally, um, but that's clear, I think, acknowledge the reality of conflicting rationalities. Try to understand policymakers if they do something different that you would, than you would like them to do. Um, and hopefully they will also better understand what we are doing and value it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dirk, for expressing our challenge to enter the knowledge the knowledge arena, the competitive knowledge arena, will try to do so. Oli, Oli Pekka is next to contribute. Your turn, please. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Oli Pekka Heinren, and um, I'm very happy with the two previous speakers here. So I try to bring maybe something, a new perspective to the discussion. And that is more a perspective of from, from looking at this issue from the decision maker's point of view. Um, I've been a minister in the Finnish gov government for eight years and been a state secretary in six different ministries in Finland. And uh, actually when I first time in 91 entered the Ministry of Education and Science as an advisor to the minister at that time, the world looked a lot different than it does today. And I think there are kind of, when we're talking about evidence-informed policy making, I think there are three things that has changed radically. The first one is that um, the problems that are on different ministry, ministers' table or on the government's table, they are wicked by character. That you cannot kind of solve them from only one perspective. When we're talking about, for example, equity issues in education, the minister of education cannot alone solve that challenge. So we need a much more kind of a holistic view and, and help both from the research side, the knowledge side, and the kind of administration policymakers side to solve that kind of problems. Another thing that has changed is the amount of knowledge, of course, uh, and the amount of information. And, uh, and that is a very challenging thing also, of course, then we come to the question that how the policymaker values different sources of knowledge and um, actually there's I think a good term nowadays used that you have also these kind of Google policy advisors who if there's a problem then they Google and they kind of give the government proposal to the minister to give to the parliament that here you have it and then there's the question that what is the quality of the knowledge behind that kind of policy advice. So, so that's another thing that has changed a lot. And then there's the third thing that has changed. In 91, it was more so that there were kind of a couple of institutions who were responsible of the research. We know the people who were the researchers and then there was the couple civil servants who were the gatekeepers of that research to the policymaker. And it was a kind of a closed pipeline of the knowledge informed policymaking. That doesn't happen anymore. There are so many different actors in the field who actively kind of um, feed the policymakers with different kind. Of, of information and, and knowledge and also research. And, and so, so that's an entirely different um, environment today. I would like to name kind of five things that from my experience 
we should do better in order to have better um, research and evidence-informed decisions. The first one is to build trust. Because that's what I'm seeing that is missing today. The, um, I hear so often the politicians saying that the researchers are living in their own academic world, in their ivory towers, and they don't know anything about the real world. And I hear so much researchers saying that if you want to keep your integrity, don't have anything to do with somebody in politics. And that's not a very kind of functioning way of seeing the different roles in evidence-informed policymaking. That we should, as Dirk was saying, we should understand the different roles of researchers and political decision makers. The role of science, or, or the logic and the process of science is so different than is the logic and process of political decision making. Other one is looking for truth with the scientific process, and other one is doing value-based decisions in a democratic process. So that should be understood, and with that understanding, the trust and cooperation and dialogue should be built. The other thing is that I think we should do better is that we should overcome the silos. And now I'm talking silos in different uh, fields. I'm talking about silos in the administration, definitely, that the holistic view on decision-making should be stronger. And then I'm talking also about silos with different research institutions and universities and disciplines because they are also a hinder for that kind of evidence that the policymakers uh, should need. My third point is that um, the time frame for policymakers is something to understand. Um, and if the evidence and research is not um, embedded in the main processes of decision-making, it doesn't exist. So it should be integrated in the kind of main decision-making processes to have that information and evidence there, because otherwise um, it, it will never meet the eyes of the policymaker. The fourth thing is that I think we need some new roles in the dialogue between the policymakers and researchers. We need kind of trusted referees or brokers who can help those two uh, actors to understand each other and communicate better with each other. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm quite kind of interested in the UK model of what works centers, because that's the question. That's the question for the policymaker, because there are, as Dirk was saying, there are different forms of knowledge. But when you ask that what works, you don't ask that what is the knowledge source of it, but you only ask that what are the solutions that seem to be working and could we take those into use. Um, my fourth, uh, my, my, my final point is that, that it is important that we also have kind of financing models that support the research used in policy making. And, 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 and we just heard about the Finnish decisions done on the strategic uh, research. Uh, initiative which is one way to try to find uh, kind of financing for kind of problem-based, solution-oriented, multidisciplinary uh, research which 
the time scale for that kind of research is about three to six years. And, and, and in that financing instrument, the communication from the very beginning of the research is something that is put high value on. So if we do th these things well, better than we have done so far, I think that kind of dealing with wicked problems at its best, it can be a kind of a shared learning process together with researchers, other knowledge providers, and to policy makers. Thank you. Thank you, Oli Pekka, for addressing that we need networking and, and trusted relations in order to compete with Google as a competitor. Manfred, your turn. Yeah, f first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to participate in this renowned panel here. I'm just waiting for my slides. But I can already say that in my initial statement, I tried to give very short answers to the many questions we received from Eero and Hans. Maybe my answers are okay now. Maybe my answers are really short, focused, and maybe a little bit exaggerated, but I think that could help stimulate the discussion later on. The first question was how is early based research perceived by policy? I hope that my neighbor will confirm that. Stakeholders in policy have to read hundreds of pages every day, but normally they do not read journals like that. Stakeholders tend to prefer more condensed, more compiled information. They prefer papers about two or three pages, really focusing a problem. So maybe the education research review is one step in the direction to condense research. But my first advice is don't offer potatoes if you can distill vodka. Maybe the only expert here for whiskey in the room will see that it's not vodka, it's whiskey. Um, but I think we have to strengthen our it attempts to review, to compile evidence out of the many studies we are doing all our days. The second question was, how relevant is the scientific quality of research for political decisions? I would say education policy normally assumes that research that has been published has a basic quality. Um, nowadays, there's a little bit of threat coming from the replication crisis in life sciences and also in parts of psychology. And I think that's one problem a little bit going in disturbing the trust that policy may have towards the quality of research. But all in all, my feeling is that until now, politicians are not complaining um, the low quality of research, they are complaining the relevance problem maybe. The quality is okay, it's assumed, but the messages are not really meeting the needs of policy, their interest in getting answers to certain questions. Third question, does the current educational research meet the demands of policy makers. I would say educational research helps or has helped to identify many problems in the education system. And I would also say that many stakeholders are grateful for getting that information. But nowadays there's also some tendency 
that policy makers have the feeling that research con is confined to identifying problems and they are a little bit driven by the problems educational research is presenting uh, and tossed by research. They are looking more for some kind of answers how the problems we identified can be, uh, can be tackled or can be, can be solved. So we need more some kind of technological knowledge in order to present options for political decisions or possible solution, solutions. And I would also say that there are too many fields until now where educational um, where areas of educational systems where research is lacking. For example, in higher education, if you think on problems that are discussed now in policy strategies for inclusion or for education in the di digital age, I think there's a real lack of research dealing with uh, strategies with um, different options that could work in the system. The next question was, what is the relevance of empirical evidence from a policy-making perspective? I would say since the age of enlightenment and in democratic societies, policy is following principles of rational reasoning, rational decisions, action, and therefore it's really interested in evidence. But we have to accept or respect that policy has also a number of other goals, political goals, for example, and also different responsibilities. Um, so policy is confronted with several goal systems, and we already heard that uh, policy has very different time frames also in relationship to the elections that are four to five years uh, times uh, where uh, policy is trying to find uh, solutions and also I would say policy is dependent on visible measures or visible um, interventions that can show clear effects during a certain time frame. Next question was, what guides the formation of opinion of policy making and administration? Here, uh, I think we have to differentiate who is policy. I would say there are not only ministries and their different levels and responsibilities. We have to take into account that there are parties, there are NGOs, advocacy groups, teacher unions, and so on. There are different kinds of consultative groups, there are endowments, there are council fundings, organizations, and so on. And I think w when we try to get more impact or get better heard in policy, we have to address the system, not only one of these organizations. So we have to think about uh, what we can do to bring our messages to different groups in policy. We have to understand the system, but we also have to be politically neutral. I think that's very important for getting trust that you mentioned uh, before. And uh, I would also say we should not forget the media and the public. And here I would like to emphasize also traditional media, because my feeling is that um, for the formation of opinion, um, traditional media are still more important than electronic uh, media. Think of uh, re renowned uh, journals, for example. The last uh, question was, are results of research about learning and instruction appropriately disseminated and communicated? So my impression is that we are not really uh, in, in a situation that we are communicating our findings, our evidence in an appropriate way. There are some attempts, and I think there are also successful at attempts, but we need more um, strategies for that. We need also to a little bit change our research approaches. What we need is more perspective taking and expectation management towards policy, for example. We have to make clear 
what kind of answers we can, uh, of, of what kind of answer we can give to uh, certain questions. Uh, we have to make clear what uh, the limitations of our research is. We have to learn to deal with the problems of fragile and conflicting evidence. That it's very challenging to explain why certain findings are contradicting another. Uh, we have also to have a look on uh, the amount of opinions we are formulating in the dialogue with politics. So there, there's a tendency that oh, we do not speak with one voice, but with uh, quite a number of. And my last, uh, last point is, I think we have also to think about uh, incentives for different types of research and different types of applications. We are focusing, first of all, publications in international journals, but the audience is very small of these international journals. We have to think about different other kinds of publications. We also have to think about more transfer-oriented research, and that means that we have to change our incentive systems for funding and also for the appreciation of our products. Thank you so much. Manfred for the insight from both research and, and policy making. Sana is your turn. Yes. Thank you, that's, that's my uh, slides. Um, first of all, also thank you from my perspective to contribute to this, this discussion today. Um, our chair gave us some homework and uh, I picked three questions there which I would like to contribute with my, my thoughts. I'm very much early in Kate's person, so my perspective comes from research on, on learning and instruction. And my claim is that um, if you understand thoroughly how people learn, you can design such learning tasks and learning environments and situations which really engage students uh, in deep learning. I agree that the world it is very much changing and also young people are different than we used to be when we went to school. But still, it is important to remember that the core mechanisms and also the, the limitations we have in our mind and how people learn still very much exists. And we are working in the areas of cognition, motivation, emotions and social interactions and they very much matter. Um, so my claim is that um, how important is early-based research in educational science? It is especially impo important understanding these processes deeply uh, because teaching and learning is never playing a set of drinks, never making just innovations or constructing attractive environments for learning, but it is always grounded on scientific understanding how people learn. Learning and teaching is, after all, science. My second point is uh, considering what is the relevance of empirical evidence from a policy-making perspective. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that money talks in education today and the problem is that we lack resources uh, instead of having more resources. But my point is that actually this evidence-based information after all saves a lot. It is cheap. Investment in evidence-based information is cheap because scientific understanding contributes to the most effective solutions in practice. 
because, for example, our research on learning and instruction help to understand and elaborate the problems in learning and education in practice. And uh, we researchers, we can diagnose these problems and explain also the mechanisms of the problems and develop better solutions which really help remedy these problems. So should educational science develop more initiatives to inform policy making and administration? Absolutely yes. We have been quite a strong guiding process of design and, and providence and, and providing evidence of student learning. This is what we have usually been doing. Uh, but uh, we may have also too naive beliefs about education as an organization may, may be too attractive to our intervention, interventions are too optimistic about the, the results to change the practice. And uh, we should put more effort on, we could put more effort supporting the work of redesigning, redesigning the system and organizational structures, not just go to schools and develop and test. Um, also, my point is that um, we need broad stakeholder involvement than we used to have, which can help address problems that are not visible to actors within one sector. And uh, this kind of thinking would help us to uh, look out of the box thinking. There are many issues we could do in a different way if we combine our understanding, thinking about school age, uh, personnel in school and education in general, age groups, length of the school days, equity issues, and, and so on. Um, in, in general, I claim that more expertise is needed in systems dynamics, knowledge of the structures of educational organizations, familiarity of the tools and concepts of policy and organizational research, and absolutely research on, on learning and instruction. Recent years, months, and, and weeks, and days have shown us that actually uh, in this world, education matters more than ever. Uh, Therefore, I would challenge us to have our joint challenge uh, in research, practice, policy, and administration, break traditional boundaries of learning for more bold and ambitious implications for increasing human competence for the 21st century learning. Because isn't this, after all, the goal of, uh, in education? Thank you. Thank you, Sana, for the ideas how to strategically implement out of the box thinking in early in future. Uh, we'll listen to Kai, your yeah, presentation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, good morning everybody. My name is uh, Kai Sauer. I'm the Finnish ambassador uh, to the United Nations. I've served in that uh, capacity for three years now and uh, uh, I have uh, still one, one year to go. I'm also a fourth generation Tampere uh, resident, uh, which makes me very proud to uh, speak at this event. I'm also an alumni of the Tampere University and um, you should know that the Tampere University is not only uh, about uh, education, it's also one of the uh, incubators of uh, Finnish uh, diplomacy. Many of our colleagues say they come from, from uh, the Tampere University. Uh, I have to make uh, a little bit of uh, advertisement as well. Uh, the Tampere Hall, uh, which uh, is uh, hosting this conference, just opened the 
uh, Mumi, Mumi Museum. If uh, we have uh, Japanese uh, friends here, I'm sure that at least uh, them, uh, they are familiar with the Mumins. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mumis and uh, I probably read all the books and uh, if, you, if you think of the Mumis, they never went to school. Um, and they are, they are very happy creatures, I, I wonder why. <laughs> uh, today's uh, theme is uh, well chosen. It's uh, education at the crossroads of economy and uh, politics. I would also like to add uh, one attribute, which is uh, international politics, and i explain uh, later uh, why. Uh, you should also know that the United Nations, uh, my working environment, is uh, uh, undergoing a big uh, change. We have a new Secretary General, uh, Portuguese former Prime Minister uh, uh, Guterres, uh, who is operating um, in an environment very much uh, determined by the new U.S. government, which is kind of a, a challenge. I'm going back uh, to New York tomorrow to prepare for the uh, next uh, high-level week, uh, the opening of the General Assembly, and uh, we will uh, listen uh, with great interest to President Trump's uh, uh, first uh, statement. Uh, as far as I know, the UN is, is still standing, uh, even in, in our absence in the summer. So, uh, coming to the topic, uh, which is Agenda 2030. Uh, now, I would like to ask you a question. Please raise your hand if you ever heard about the Agenda 2030. We'll make a quick uh, poll. Raise your hand if you heard about uh, Agenda 2030. Is it a familiar concept? Okay, I would say maybe 37% of the attendants <laughs> have heard about this concept, which is uh, quite, quite good. Um, in Finland, they made a, a poll which uh, uh, the result was that about 75% of the Finnish population was uh, familiar with the concept. I think it was a bit uh, optimistic. Um, but this is also good in the sense that I can tell you something new, perhaps, uh, uh, today. So uh, the Agenda 2030 uh, was uh, adopted in 2015. Um, it has uh, 17 goals, uh, which are uh, nicely displayed uh, with these uh, symbols on the right. And um, uh, the 17 goals are broken down in not 123, that's fake news, it's uh, 169 uh, targets, 169 targets. If uh, anybody would like to uh, make notes, uh, that's the correct uh, figure. Uh, and these targets are further broken down in thousands of uh, different indicators. It was a very difficult political process. It took uh, uh, years uh, to be adopted in 2015. Uh, the background of the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, was the MDG uh, process, the Millennium Development Goals, which was uh, uh, set into motion uh, in 2000 and uh, it went on until 2015. So now we are uh, beginning the 15-year cycle of the uh, sustainable Development Goals in the form of the Agenda 2030. It's a very inclusive uh, uh, pro process. I'll come back to that uh, later as well. And it's a very expensive uh, process. The cost estimate of the Agenda 2030 is $4.5 trillion per year, which is uh, the, well, the equivalent of the French uh, uh, GDP. So, of course, you need a financing plan for such an uh, undertaking as well. And uh, uh, I think we are, we are currently working on that. Very good. So, the characteristics of the Agenda 30 are uh, the following ones. It's a system-wide driver of the United Nations. It has an impact on the whole system. 
It also requires a reform of the United Nations. It's inclusive by nature. It's not intergovernmental. It's not, not only governments talking to each other. It requires the participation and the buy-in of the private sector, the civil society, and the others. Others like you, the academia, experts. And uh, of course, uh, the citizens uh, should not be forgotten, neither. Uh, there's an annual review every year. Um, countries can present their uh, national voluntary review and uh, that is called the High-Level Political Forum. Finland was uh, participating in the, in the review in the group of the first countries last year. So, what has this all to do with you? As you perhaps noticed, goal number four was uh, education. And this is the exact title of the goal. Ensure inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning. Most of the goals, they have a home in the UN system, and the home of goal number four is uh, UNICEF. And then we proceed uh, to the targets. Um, I'm not going to go through all the 10 targets, but uh, I could uh, highlight the fact that this, uh, the targets are very much uh, gender-oriented. Girls and women are given pre presidents. Uh, other vulnerable uh, groups are mentioned as well. Persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and uh, maybe uh, to the interest of uh, this uh, audience, you should look at the last uh, bullet point, substantially increase the supply of qualified uh, teachers, which is, uh, of course, extremely important. So, uh, the role of the academia if we want to reduce it, uh, deduct it uh, to three main uh, topics, I would say it's a scientific uh, role. It's providing and analyzing uh, data. Then, of course, innovation. We expect uh, the academia to create uh, solutions to the Agenda 2030 implementation. And then political. You are a great uh, advocacy group. You have uh, clout, uh, respectability. Your voice uh, is heard. So you can influence the political decision makers in uh, promoting goal number four. So in conclusion, um, I would just like to refer to a few sources. Uh, I guess most of, the, most of you are on Twitter. There are a few, few links, the UN, the President of the General Assembly, etc. I would like to highlight uh, this lady. Uh, she's the Deputy Secretary General uh, who has been tasked uh, to be in charge of the Agenda 2030 implementation. She's the former Minister of Environment of uh, Nigeria, a very competent lady. And uh, with this, uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Kai, for addressing that. We already are in the position to have trust and to have uh, the role of advocacy. That's what, what Oli Pecker also had, had told. That's a big job. Dirk, is, are there already the solutions for your problems here? Just uh, your response to that topic of, of, tr of trust that was risen by two panelists. I very much liked the, the argument in favor of trust. It's a, a very important concept in, in today's thinking about society and politics. Um, the main reason why I didn't use it is because it risks to become a bit naive. We just have to trust each other more. I think underneath trust, there has to be a hard basis of why we trust each other. And um, I don't believe that 
this basis is there today. There is a lot of mistrust, and we have to understand why this is why this is the case. And maybe a certain amount of distrust is also productive. These are two very different communities. The, uh, policymakers have different obligations, different value systems, have to respond to different outside constituencies and and and. Uh, and people um, than, than scientists and researchers. Um, I don't like the ivory tower argument. I think um, I hear it less often than in the past, but there is certainly a problem about relevance which, which you have um, tackled. Um, although in my perception, most ministers understand that researchers have a different kind of job, have a different kind of responsibility um, and that the policy questions are not always the questions that should drive educational research. So I'm, I'm a bit more humble in my ambitions. I think we have to improve the communication channels between the two communities, uh, understanding why they are so different. Um, more trust would be good, more social capitals would, would be good, um, but let's really um, value the differences between the two systems. That's ma ma mainly my argument. Yes, thank you. I think that trust is enormously important, but, uh, but still I think that there is, at least in Finland, a lot of dialogue between researchers and policymakers. Uh, I know that our researchers and professors are sitting in several committees. They, their uh, advice is used. We are writing statements on different phases of law preparation. Our students are, are trained in the <laughs> ministry uh, position. So there is a lot of interaction, at least in a country like Finland, which is relatively small and of course we are educating the civil servants that is one of the most important impact of, of the universities but what i think is critical is the role of media and politicians when they are uh, when they spoke out the uh, views i mean a kind of uh, simplistic views and populist is maybe a big threat of today that uh, that uh, that issues like uh, Olibeka was saying that wicked <laughs> problems where you can have different kind of uh, uh, cause and uh, uh, different kind of causal explanations you need to understand that there are different kind of angles i mean issues are complicated and we need uh, very educated civil society. We need very good media, very good communication, and uh, that is a challenge in modern, uni modern societies where the information flows are so quick. Thank you for, for pointing out this media issue. I don't want to make media guilty guilty uh, for, for this uh, uh, policy and research dialogue to practice, but I have to say that uh, in Finland now we are renewing curriculum in our, our schools, which is a great work, huge effort, but I'm very disappointed that um, many of the colleagues also here in this audience are tired about giving feedback, comments, in, in media, and we see more and more uh, people giving arguments, feelings, uh, spontaneous ideas, not evidence-based feedback. I don't know what is the problem, perhaps this is the change of media culture in these days, but it is not attractive for researchers to communicate. And this is quite scaring at the moment if we do these changes and effort, and we lose an opportunity to contribute from the science in the public discussion because that really makes that really matters to practice schools and teachers and families. We talked about trust. Uh, I would like to mention also the problems of funding. Uh, Dirk van Damme mentioned the difference between health and education. 
And when I have a look to our colleagues, our very clever colleagues in medicine, they have different approaches, they have different programs. For example, translational medicine is highly problem-oriented. So the idea is to fuck your certain diseases and to have translational change from basic research from bench to bedside and to, health, uh, to public health research, for example. We do not have such translation chains in our education communities. And I think it would be very important to offer some kind of program from our side, bottom up, not top down, to say we are, as a research community, in a position that we could try to have more coordination between our basic and applied research but in order to solve certain problems, for example, problem of inclusion or some others. That's, I think, for us important that we try to come up with ideas and not waiting for ideas from policy, because they always come too late and at the time we are not, we are not really prepared for that. So um, I think we have to, to change a little bit our minds and think about what could be other ways where we can offer certain approaches or programs where we can communicate that we could try to, uh, to confine or to focus our research for a decade, for example, in order to have uh, solutions that can really work. And that can be communicated, I think. Uh, and I think also that until now, at, at least of my perception, that um, the policy would give us some kind of credit for doing that, because they saw that during the last decades, the quality of educational research improved really significantly. We have a lot of new methods, we have approaches, we have large-scale approaches and small cage. we have a basic research that is excellent, we have to combine these things. Uh, no, I'm a civil servant actually, so I'm, I'm not a policymaker uh, in that sense, uh, although in the wider sense that was described here that who you should kind of include when you're talking about policymaking. Uh, I, I agree with the fact that uh, you need to understand the different roles of uh, research, the academia, and the policy making, and and they are very different by character. And then you should be able, with that roles, to communicate and do action research together. And 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 that is the kind of challenge when, if the language we are talking about is very different. And, 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 and what, what Lisa was saying about the thing that, that kind of quite often in today's world we're looking for easy solutions, kind of very, very, uh, which are kind of so, so uh, simple that, as somebody said, that they could fit in a nutshell and should stay there also. Uh, and, and, and that makes it kind of difficult because the research, as it was said here, uh, the logic with it and the different perspectives and disciplines, they bring in different views. And then the policymakers should also understand that these views that look conflicting, they have a different context that they are coming from. And this kind of literacy from, from policy makers' side is needed, and then, of course, what you were referring to, and, and Eric also, that, that uh, also the researchers should have the literacy, literacy of understanding that, that how the democratic process is functioning. I must say that I'm a bit worried about the fact that I'm seeing these days countries that uh, are not entirely democracies which are very effective in using research in their develop in their in their uh, policy making uh, and 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 that's the que challenge a bit that that is it so that with democracy 
we have a problem of kind of integrating the use of evidence in our system. Somebody was referring to the electorate period. Uh, and that is something that, that quite often, in order to take the, the uh, use of research, you should have also a kind of a longer perspective on the decision making. And the electric, uh, electoral um, um, period kind of makes a hinder for that. Just one question. There were, there were several topics, and I just wanted to hand over to you to maybe you answer that. That we saw some ideas how policy making and, and education could be related to each other. And there were, at least in our country, some attempts which were based on OECD activities, and that were the large scale studies, international comparison between educational systems. And there, the actor where the, the communication took place very often is at the national level. And we learned that it's important within Finland to have internationalization as a, str a strategic goal. And that is, of course, what OECD provides, lots of information and impact. But we learned from Kai's presentation that, on another side of view, the problem is not a national one, but we need it. The, the international, the very big holistic view, is that a contradiction? That's a question to you and to, and to all others. I was not going to speak about PISA, <laughs> um, but I, I think it's true that the international environment has had an enormous impact on the way that people have been thinking about education and policy making and development. Um, and PISA is only one part of it, be it a very powerful part, and for some people maybe too powerful. Um, but the international context, the SDG framework is very important today. Um, we try at the OECD to to build our own knowledge systems and evidence bases um, through various programs. We also try to fulfill a little bit that translational kind of role, which I think is absolutely very important. Um, but I want to, to point at something which we didn't touch upon, that's um, the role of other intermediate powers in the system, uh, the profession uh, especially. Uh, because in my view, well, I experienced several meetings with ministers who were actually quite sympathetic to some research findings, but when they were when in, were in a room with some of the powers that prevail in education, uh, school boards, teacher unions, uh, municipalities, etc., they all said, no minister, we don't want to hear about this. So I don't think that ministers or education policy makers sometimes are the most adversaries to educational research findings or the implementation of, of educational research informed policies. But um, I think the profession and the powers that be in education are sometimes much more conservative. And in education, we have the problem which is different from health, that the profession is insufficiently scientifically literate. Um, maybe it's different in Finland with its excellent and world-class teacher training system, but in many other countries you really have the problem that teacher training is built on very old-fashioned ideas. My daughter has studied for teacher, she's an excellent teacher. I just out of curiosity looked into her handbooks. Well, there was nothing. The last chapter was on Vygotsky. There was nothing happened after Vygotsky. Um, I'm not saying that Vygotsky is not important, it's absolutely critical. But um, the, the teacher, teacher training is, I'm not saying lacking in quality, but it's not up to date with current um, educational research. And teachers are trained in some countries, including my own, in a kind of mentality. Um, it's not research that counts, it's the practice, and we know how to do it. And when you go into a school, you are told as a young teacher, forget everything you learned, including research, we know how you will do it. Um, and this is, this is important, because in, in the health system, medical doctors have a natural link to the research system. Teachers don't have that. We don't have well-functioning professional development systems. We don't have reward systems that incentivize teachers to keep up with educational research. I'm exaggerating a little bit, 
And in some countries it's says different. I know that it's very much different in Finland, but in many countries this is a real problem. Can I just say the fact that I, I totally agree and, and uh, I, I would say that it's different in Finland, that, that the, the teachers with their high te uh, university level education, they have the ability to connect to research in their work. And uh, from my perspective today at looking at the education system how it's functioning, uh, I think actually that's the only sustainable way to have a functioning system is that, that there's a direct link between the teachers and the learning community in schools and the research. Cause going kind of through national administration, that, that is a very vulnerable and slow way to react to the changes of world and get getting into use the new findings of research. So, so I think from the Finnish perspective, as it was said, that we do have a high quality teacher education. Uh, I think we should actually start, uh, continue getting it to the level even higher than it's today. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I just want to come in uh, in this role of an outsider a, li a little bit and uh, uh, draw draw your attention uh, to, and my, in my experience, if you want to achieve something uh, which is difficult, you should always use a financial argument uh, and uh, try to uh, convince uh, the other party with, uh, with uh, economic uh, incentives. And uh, when, when I was preparing for, for this uh, discussion, I, I was going through all, uh, lots of uh, material from UNESCO, and they have a fascinating uh, uh, new report about um, how, how investing uh, into education brings uh, uh, returns. It's about uh, uh, 7 to 10 percent uh, uh, return if you invest in, in education. I think it's, it's quite a, a solid uh, case. Uh, also, a statistical fact that each uh, year at school increases wages by, by 10 percent in your professional life. It's, it's also, I mean, who, who can counter argue with uh, something like this? So uh, when we are uh, trying to convince the policymakers perhaps not in our own countries, but uh, in, in some uh, third world uh, uh, countries uh, who have to make the decision uh, uh, where to put the, their money when uh, try to achieve a higher excellence of development, uh, well, uh, in, in this case uh, implementing the Agenda 2030. So the case for, for, for education is quite, quite high also from, from this uh, incentive perspective. Thank you. Um, I would like to add here that I'm, I'm, I'm very much proud of our Finnish academic teacher education and I can't, I don't want to repeat, repeat that, but I, I believe that uh, academic teachers understand uh, the scientific thinking behind their practice and this is something which really attracts best young people to study to be teachers and also it gives them academic education which lasts uh, during their careers. But what could we do better is to facilitate, as you mentioned, uh, uh, their professional development because it seems to be an uh, area which is at the moment weak and uh, right now we have been doing, uh, or Ministry of Education have been doing um, some new kind of funding instruments to fund uh, networking and bridging research, researchers, uh, schools, technologies, practice, teacher education. I'm very curious to see whether this is a kind of model we can facilitate interaction uh, from research to practice continuously uh, and ha help 
to make these policy decisions uh, and scientific evidence true. Uh, we would need more funding for that, to be uh, honest, but I'm very curious to see whether, and I think we should be more creative to do these kind of models, not only educate excellent teachers and then leave them there, uh, but find out new ways to support their work. Thank you, everybody. Time is running. I got the sign, and that is unbelievable. We just started discussing, and I would have liked to hear each of you six persons' voice at least one hour more, but I'm afraid I'm not allowed to, to continue here. I got the sign that that is a very important discussion, and, and it's very clear to us within early that we have to face this challenge to discuss and redesign the relation between our research science and the society and the, the players in society, universities, ministries, international organizations, supranational organizations, more intensively and have to put that as part of our strategy and our development. I'm sure that Sana will do that as a leader of, of this organization. So we recognize that that is a topic. We still don't have solutions, but we know many approaches how to do that. And we are very happy that we had you here and f got very different different ideas what to do next. And we'll try to, to impact on early and try to impact from early onto, soci onto society, onto policy making. Thank you, everybody, for being here and inspiring us so much. Thank you very much.